How a Romance Novel Saved the Galaxy by Ariana Derrote. Chapter 77, Jaster 14. I've been thinking, said Jaster, tugging Joe a bit closer to him in bed. He'd woken up a few minutes ago by racing and surprisingly hangover free. He wondered if he had his Jedi lovers to thank for that. Hmm? Huh? She said a bit sleepily. It was adorable how she let her guard down. Yes, asked Jan. He was, rather predictably, already awake and reading a pad at a nearby table while sipping some calf. Jaster wondered if he knew he was faintly grimacing after every sip. He made a mental note to get a hold of whatever posh type of calf his overly picky Jedi preferred. I am unexpectedly in need of some lightsaber lessons. Jaster could tell by the way Jan imperceptibly straightened up even further in his seat that he was interested. Jo, too, sat up in bed, though she yawned a little. After breakfast? she asked. After breakfast, Aunt Calf, Jaster confirmed. They got dressed and headed outside. Django was nowhere to be found. Jaster hoped that meant he'd found his own companion for the night, but it was just as likely he was making himself scarce to avoid even the possibility of hearing more about Jaster's sex life. Once they were done with breakfast, they headed over to the training area. Do you have any training and sword play? asked Jocasta. I know some of the standard Buscat forms. Then show us with the dark saber. Demanded Joe. He was all business. Jaster pulled out the dark saber and turned it on. There was none of the harsh vibration he'd felt on Concordia. It did slightly vibrate his arms like any lightsaber would, but as he'd noticed last night during his speech, it almost seemed to resonate with his Beskar. He dropped into the most basic Beskad stance and immediately wobbled. Beskad were large and heavy with their point of balance somewhere in the middle of the blade, but like all lightsabers, the dark saber's point of balance was in the hilt. Nonetheless, he went through the standard Beskad attacks, feeling off balance the entire time. Both Jocasta and Jan watched with interest, then exchanged a glance once he was done. Let's fix your stunts first, suggested Joe. Plant your feet facing forward and widen the space between them until your hips feel just slightly strained. Jaster did so. Now take a natural step forward with your right foot while leaving your left where it is. No, but your knees, slightly, continued Jan. That is the basic she tore stance, finished Joe. It wasn't too different from one of the basic Beskad stances, but the bent knees and wideness made him feel much more solidly connected to the ground. He no longer felt off balance. Now the basic strike is two-handed with the right hand on top, said Jan. He demonstrated by holding his own unlit lightsaber in front of him, facing Jester, though he had to shorten his hold slightly due to the curve near the end. The strike begins and ends with your hands at waist height. You step forward with your back leg, you strike across, and down. Jaster had to do the strike a few times, with Joe or Jan suggesting minute adjustments to his stance and hand positions before they were satisfied. Now do that a hundred times said Joe with a wicked smile. Jan inclined his head in agreement. Jaster sighed, but returned Joe's smile. He did need to embed this new stance in his muscle memory, and repetition was the only way to do so. He settled into the start and began mentally counting his strikes. In the meantime, Jan and Joe watched him critically, but eventually devolved into a rather fierce debate. To an outsider, it would have looked like the two hated each other, but Jaster could tell by the crinkles around Joe's eyes and the faint upturning of Jan's mouth that they were enjoying their fight. Makashi is hardly the most appropriate form for him. Neither is Sarasu. The lack of false guidance will make deflecting the shots nearly impossible for him. Disregarding the deflecting aspects of the style, Jaster's training in Tanfa is perfect to adapt to Sarasu, insisted Jagastu. Yes, his training in Tonfa will also lend itself well to the one-handed style of Makashi. Makashi is for fighting multiple lightsaber-winning opponents. When do we expect him to be fighting against lightsabers? asked Joe. Even if the Sith are extinct, Darksiders still exist and always will. I will concede that, but why do we expect the Mandalore to be fighting them? Jan seemed to ignore the question. If we are looking for a form that combines the attacks of Makashi with the defense of Suresu, and taking into account Jaster's tonfa training, he trailed off. 
Shin, with a reverse grip, said Job. Shin, said Jan at the same time. He looked sideways at Jocasta. Reverse grip is controversial. He's already using it to wheel his taffa, she said almost sweetly. Jan gave a faint nod, and with that, their argument ended. They turned back to him with a gleam in their eyes. Jaster had a feeling they were going to work him to the bone, but he was going to enjoy every minute of it. Jaster discreetly took a painkiller for his aching muscles before he headed out to meet what he'd been informed was an approaching Jedi transport. Jan and Jocasta were busy quizzing Tare's holocron over minutiae of the Darksaber. Most Jedi cleaned the insides of theirs, replaced worn parts, etc., periodically since they were not 100% water or dust proof. But the Darksaber hadn't been cleaned in nearly 1,000 years, so they were checking to see what maintenance, if any, Jaster needed to perform. And apparently it was only Jaster who could perform it, since kyber crystals were semi-sentient, of all things, and it liked him! Poor stuff was so kind and weird sometimes. It was impossible to keep his people from crowding the area when the Jedi transport touched down. Jaster's only consolation was that many had gone home now that the Concordia assault was over, so it was at least only his super commandos lingering eagerly. First off was a green-skinned Hodin wearing a black cloak. Their magenta tube black tresses were fading to white in places, his younger Verde looked disappointed since the white indicated advanced age, but the Hodin was soon followed by a younger Pantoran Jedi with a cascade of pink hair. That Jedi had Benin Kriz eagerly running up to speak to them, and Benin Kriz had the icy gazes of many a Verde on his back. I am Master Plit, the master currently in charge of Agrico. He, him, or they, them are both acceptable, the Hodin said. This is my assistant, Jedi Siaspachi. She, her. Jaster's impression had been that Agricor was going to take their time getting to Mandalore, perhaps visiting after Knight Zaid's report was completed. However, the news of Tade's cache of preserved seeds and samples had been passed on, and now the leader of Agricor was on planet. Welcome to Mandalore. We're eager to work with Agricor to restore our worlds, Jaster said. We have a trip to the Mandalorian Temple plan tomorrow. They were still keeping the existence of Tare's cache a secret to the public, so he wouldn't mention that except for insecure places like his office. That would be acceptable, said Platt. I will inform Night Zane to meet us there. Master? asked Siaf. She and Benin had been looking at a pad Benin brought, and she was almost vibrating with excitement. Platt turned to Siaf. Yes, yes, just find me later. She gave the elder Jedi a brilliant smile before rushing off. Plan shook his head, though the look on his face was fond. He's apparently brought her a whole list of Mandalorian books to look at. Young scholars, eh? Jaster thought back to the pad filled with obscure Mandalorian historical texts that he dipped in Jocasta. Ah, Unon, said Jaster, picking a random older Verde who was hopefully crowding around them. Could you show Master Plet to the Jedi's quarters? Nicolor! They looked thrilled at the task, but also a bit terrified at making small talk with a jetty. Jaster's attention was drawn to another Jedi heading down the ramp. They looked young, which caused a ripple of excitement to go through the Verde. The Jedi looked around before focusing easily on Jaster. I'm Jedi Knight Debamilma, they said with a bow. They were Chalactan, if Jaster recognized their facial decorations and the loops of their hairstyle correctly. This isn't the motion in the Vivenda sector I last heard about, said Windu to his right. When had the Jedi stuck up on him, especially now that he saw Obi-Wan was at the man's side? I was going to surprise you with a visit to the temple, Master. Imagine my surprise when I arrived to find you gone, and the gossip was that I had a new Padawan brother. They bent down a little so their face was even with Obi-Wan's. Hello, Obi-Wan. I'm your older Padawan's sister. Hello, said Obi-Wan shyly. Don't worry, I'll tell you all about what you expect with him as your master. Windu sighed. I'm sorry, my dear. She gave him a look that clearly communicated. She was well aware. Obi-Wan Kenobi looked a little in awe. So did Jester's Verde. How did you manage to get a mission to Mandalo of all places? Asked Windu. At the question, Billima straightened, her face a bit of grins. 
I'm escorting a paddle on to meet his master. Windu looked around. Oh, he tilted his head, maybe reaching out with the force? No. Billabong nodded solemnly. It's not like we could send him to Thalme on his lonesome. If Joshua wasn't mistaken, he thought he heard young Owen one mother. Oh no. The young teenage Kippar who strode out of the ship like he owned it had deep marks of some sort of rope across his bare arms. The arms of his robes, unlike most Jedi, were tied haphazardly around his waist. Oh no, Agricor were so good with bondage, he said with a grin. I told you not to touch their biological samples, said Billabob with a sigh. But the one was, said Windu, please recall our last conversation about behavior around Mandalorians and conduct yourself accordingly. Hey, I have an official mission here, he turned to Jasper. I'm here to touch your Death Watch stuff, the teenager declared and wiggled gloved fingers in the air. Voss, sighed out Windu. Seriously, Thalme thinks I might get some clues from the stuff they left behind when they fled? After I check that, I'm supposed to join him in his investigations. Billabal nodded. I'll be monitoring him while he uses his psychosymmetry. It took her saying that for Jaster to realize that Voss was going to try to understand Deathwatch's actions through actual touch, similar to Knight Ligro reading the past when Obi-Wan went missing. Voss turned to talk to Jaster. It will be best if it's something habitually used by Death Watch and Tor Vizsla in particular. Like, say, the Darksaber. His eyes were fixed on the weapon at Jaster's waist. No! said every Jedi present, including Obi-Wan in strange unison. Voss, said Mace, rubbing his forehead. Don't touch any of Death Watch's weapons or armor for that matter. Four more weapons and armor as well, said the man when the team went to object. Don't worry, said Jasser. He ain't gotten Voss's measure by now. I know exactly the most common thing Torvizla touched, and it's not his weapons. He paused in anticipation. He had a private pressure after all. He was proud to say that even Windu cracked his smile at that one. Even you're laughing at me, Obi-Wan? Asked Voss, fake batting. I'm sorry, do I know you? Asked Obi-Wan, pointedly. Obi-Wan! Quinlan whined. You're not still holding a grudge, are you? I didn't mean to get you in trouble. You never mean to, Quinlan. Well, now you have a prestigious master to get you out of any trouble, so it's fine. Go to to what you believe, said Mace, clearly repeating something said many times. The purpose of your master is not to get you out of trouble. The teen waved his hand dismissively. Yes, yes, it's to teach me how to get myself out of trouble. Well, I can get myself into and out of trouble quite fine on my own. Quinlan Voss didn't seem to realize this wasn't the brag. He thought it was. Hyam reached out, tugging at Nared's short hair to pull him up for a kiss. Nared allowed it, but used the opportunity to pin the offending hand above Hyam's head. He searched blindly for the other one as he explored Hyam's mouth. Nared pulled back after he had both hands pinned above the jetty's head. Hyam looked perfectly comfortable with being restrained, so Nared turned sideways, keeping one hand up there, while he turned back to exploring the Jedi's body with his mouth.